We're continuing in Ephesians. We're in chapter five. This is week five, and we've been talking about how this book displays for us what God's purpose is for the world and for us. The first three chapters were all about that. And what is God's purpose for us? It's to bring us lovingly back to himself. That's what he is active in doing each and every day from before we could remember to the time when we will not know what's even happening, which frankly is tomorrow. I don't know about you, but tomorrow is is dicey. What is going to happen? I don't know, but I know that the Lord has it. I know he's in control and I know that somehow he's going to work to bring me back to himself. Now, how do we actually do that? Paul has shifted in these last three chapters into helping teach us how we are to live. And he starts off last week by reminding us that we are called to walk the way of Jesus. If you heard that in, in chapter five, it says, imitate Jesus. Imitate him. And all that you do, imitate who he is. So last week, we talked about how we go about doing that. We've been given guides to go along our way. We're not alone in this. You've been given people who can mentor you, coach you, who you can watch who have been doing this longer than you have or have done it, well, in deeper ways. You can learn who Jesus is, what he's all about, what this way of Jesus is, simply by engaging with the people who are around you, who can help guide you and teach you. The second thing is to get out of your own way. So many times we put up so many obstacles from the brokenness that's within us that we cease to see that Jesus is this last thing. He's our leader, right? Stay close to the leader. Who's the leader? It's Jesus, right? That's always the answer. When the pastor prompts you for the answer, if it's a one word answer, all the time, it's always Jesus because that's, frankly, that's what we want you to remember. We want you to know that Jesus is the answer, that he is the one that we focus on. He is our leader. And as we navigate this life that we have and navigate this life full of brokenness, full of all these things that come upon us that we would never have anticipated, he is there and he is leading us. He's calling us to follow him, not out of guilt or of shame or of obedience, but out of great love, because that's what God's about, right? He's about reconnecting us with him each and every day of our lives. So when we stay close to our leader, when we get out of our own way, when we see the people around us, the people who are here to encourage us and help us, we start to understand what it means to live this life as somebody who is greatly and dearly loved by Jesus. That doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean we don't need to take some time and figure out how it works. If you remember in chapters one and two, God talked a lot about the power that he was going to use to accomplish his purpose. And in this world, there's lots of different types of power that we can use. But God's chosen power is hope. The way that he said he's going to transform this world and bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven is through the hope of Jesus that changes you and it changes the people around you and it makes us look at the world differently. And as God uses that different power, well, it changes the way we look at our relationships. It changes the way that we look at especially the people who are closest to us. So in this section, in chapter five, uh, we're going to see that this verse is the guiding light for the rest of what we're going to talk about. In Ephesians chapter five, verse 21, Paul says this. Would you read this with me? Submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. Okay, submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. So that primary relationship is with Jesus. We see him, we follow him, we understand, we try to understand who he is so that we can imitate that within our world. And and the one way Paul says we're going to do that is by submitting to one another. All right. Uh, Previously, this word submit has been called the S word in the Bible. (laughs) If it was four letters, it would kind of come across that way. Why? Because this word is really difficult. In fact, my goal for today is to get through preaching the sermon three times and not get in trouble by the time I go home. (laughs) That's, That's the goal. Because it's difficult. This concept of submitting to one another, mutual submission, flies in the face of pretty much everything that we see out in the world. However, it's the way that God calls us to relate to the people around us. It's how we bring hope. It's how we imitate who Christ is. So we're going to talk about this in three pieces that Paul works his way through. Talk about submitting to one another in marriage, in family, and in wider society. 
All right, this is the big one, all right? You heard this. As we read through it, you're thinking, oh, I came to church on a good day. What's pastor going to do with this? Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. What do we think of this? How has this been taken? How have you heard things like this used over the course of your life? This is, this is a difficult one. When we think about it, though, in the context of what God is doing through Ephesians here, what Paul is teaching, he's saying, look, different purpose, different power. If the purpose is to reconnect people to God and help them see that he is the one who brings true life, he's going to use a different power for that. The power is hope. The power is grace. And so as we relate to one another, we get this idea of mutual submission. So Paul has to start somewhere, and he starts with wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Are wives called to submit to their husbands simply because they're husbands? Is that what this says? It says, as to the Lord. Your primary relationship is with Jesus. He's the one who has called you his own. He gives you gifts and skills and talents and strengths. He gives you people around you to encourage you. And as you follow him, as you have chosen to be one with another person, as husband and wife, submit to them. Submit to them. This follows from mutual submission, right? Submit to one another as in Christ. Now, this is where guys get in trouble. Guys, I want to, the Valentine's Day is coming up. You don't want to start messing things up right now. This is where you get in trouble because we stop here. So many people stop here. I've heard this from so many people. The Bible tells us that women have to be submissive to their husbands. In context, what is the context? Mutual submission. And Paul doesn't stop here. In fact, this is only like three verses. He has like nine verses for husbands. Husbands, you need to die for your wives. That's what he says. The next thing is, yes, wives submit to husbands, but husbands, you need to lay down your life for your wives. And guys take this so physically, like, would I step in front of a car for my wife? Yes, absolutely. It's great. Wonderful. But it's more than that. When he says, give up yourself for your wife, just as Christ said, it's not just physical. It's emotional. It's giving up your needs, your wants, your desires for the good of the one that you have been joined to. You see, this whole idea of submission isn't just physical. It's about giving up your needs, your wants, your desires for the good of other people because you understand that Jesus has loved you. He provides you with everything that you need. And he calls you to share that and be that for other people. Marriages work incredibly well when both partners submit to one another, when they put the other's needs above their own, when they seek to serve them at every opportunity. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love and submit to your wives as Christ has loved his church. This works together. Why? So that you will be joined as one. Paul goes back to uh, Genesis at the beginning, first Adam and Eve. Why would a husband and wife be joined together? Why would they be made one? Well, because that's what God calls this unit to be. Not just one physically, but one in every way to be together. Through this, we are able to show the world where hope lives. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I have always done this perfectly, right? Uh, no chuckles? No, thanks. All right. uh, this is hard, nor will I expect this of you and say, you need to do this perfectly because this is hard but it's a worthy aim. This is where our eyes need to be pointed. When a husband and wife, a bride and a groom come up to this altar and get married, that's where we point their eyes to be made one. When you recommit yourselves to one another, that's where our eyes are pointed to be made one. When you're having difficulty in your marriage and this power dynamic is different and, and it's really hard to give up anything of yourself because you think you're going to be taken advantage of. The call is back to repentance and the call is back to seeing the way this works best is together as one. Anyone who takes these verses out of context and tells you that wives need to submit with husbands without also putting in the other side of it and pointing you to see that they need to be made one are not preaching scripture correctly. It has to go together. 
And this is the witness of the entire scriptures. Together, as one, we make up this unit of a husband and a wife, this marriage relationship through which the love of Christ is shown together and through which it permeates throughout the world. When it's tough, where do you point your eyes? When your relationship goes through those dips, where do you find strength? Well, Jesus keeps pointing you back to him. Find it in your leader. Find it in who Jesus has been for you and in what he has taught you to do. In submitting to one another and admitting faults and asking for forgiveness and giving forgiveness when it's hard, you start to reconnect. You start to come back together again to be that one unit. This, this friends, this, this is the goal. This is what the scripture is talking about. Let's go outward from here. We've got this most intimate of relationships, and then we get kind of the next level of intimate relationships, that, that, that family of kids and of, of parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is pretty simple. This is fourth commandment stuff. Honor your father and mother. Yeah, it goes back and says that this is the first commandment that's been given with a blessing and a promise. If you obey and honor your father and mother, life will go well. <laughs> that's what we say to our kids at least, right? Well, that's what scripture says, so it's good. Just listen to us. We know what we're talking about. A lot of times we know what we're talking about because we've made those mistakes before. We've screwed that up. We've gone the wrong way. And we'd love for you not to experience that suffering and that pain that we did. But our kids aren't perfect yet. They're going to make mistakes, not just the innocuous ones. They're going to make big mistakes. So how do we deal with it? Well, Paul comes back. This is about mutual submission. If children are going to obey their parents and Lord, what is God setting up between children and parents? Is it again this dominion, this domineering kind of parenting? No, he says, fathers, do not provoke your children. Do not provoke them to anger, but bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. What does that mean? Does it mean that fathers, well, well don't talk to them and get angry about them, but be very strict about everything that they do so they follow this path perfectly? Is that what it's saying? You could interpret it that way. I don't think that makes sense within the context. This is about mutual submission. This is about children obeying and honoring their parents. And so parents, what do you do? Well, you speak back to them the instruction of the Lord, the ways of the Lord. And where does that start? Where does it start for you? It starts with you understanding that you are an incredibly loved child of God, that you have been given gifts and skills and talents that he calls you to use and to develop. And he gives you people around you to encourage you in this. Fathers, mothers, this is the call. As your children obey and love and honor you, you are called to teach and love them as the Lord does. The Lord has blessed you with them for only as much time as he has given to you with them. Use it well. Let them know that they are so incredibly loved that nothing, nothing could shake them. Together, mutual submission, working together. That's how these things work, these relationships. So let's go even further out. How does this work within society? Well, Paul goes further on. He says, bond servants. Anybody thought of himself as a bond servant lately? No, it doesn't. Let's, let's widen this a little bit. What Paul is talking about here is the way that you interact with and use your gifts and skills and your callings in this world. I don't know what you guys do for a living, but typically that's what we think of as kind of our main vocation or our calling. But it's not just what you do for a living, what you get paid for, but it's how you interact with the relationships and the people around you, whether you serve like on an HOA board or a PTA, whether you are part of a neighborhood group, whatever, wherever that is, this is what it's talking about. The people that are over you, if there's authority there, serve them, obey them, but not as their bondservants, not as earthly bondservants, but as people who are connected with Christ. So the authority that's given to those on this earth, well, the authority of Christ is superseding. Do all of your work, all the things that you do, as if it was the will of God, do it from the heart. <clears throat> this, is, this is the key. <clears throat> when we do our work, why do we do our work? <clears throat> it's possible to see our work as being serving Christ first and doing what he calls us to do even though we are under the authority of so many others. Many of you have layers of authority over you as well, and some days you don't know who you're supposed to report to or what you're supposed to do. I get it. 
Paul says, you know who you're reporting to. Go about the way that you do your work knowing that you are following Christ in all of that. That's an incredible gift. Sometimes it's freeing as well. It's also a call to integrity that even when nobody's watching you do what you do, that you're doing the will of Christ in what you do. It goes both ways though. So if we serve and we obey authority in this way, well, that means the authority has to do the same thing. Mutually submissive, mutually submissive. Masters do this same thing with good will. In other words, those who have authority in this world don't lord it over others because you are not the Lord. There is only one. You may have authority in some ways, but do so knowing that your master in heaven is the master of those you serve, you serve as well, which means that leadership, authority in this realm is servanthood. When authority is working well, according to Paul, it is serving the people who they have authority over. I think that changes our perspective sometimes on our jobs, on maybe some of our bosses, you know, on the way that we have other authorities. They're called to serve because we are both serving, not one another. We're serving our master in heaven. This is not easy, right? The way of Jesus is not easy. It's simple in the fact of you are loved, you are called to be with him, he is here for you to follow, but it's not easy. Going back to this scripture to see how it makes sense within this perspective of mutual submission gives us a viewpoint, an advantage to look at the world, to look at ourselves, to look at our spouses and our families in a different way than what the world would ask us to do. When we do this, we see that this idea of mutual submission is what brings hope and what brings grace into the lives of the people around us. And that is truly what we're called to do. So would you read this one more time with me? Submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. This is how we, the church, go into the world to show people who Jesus is that we are incredibly loved, that we are incredibly gifted, and we are called to bring hope and grace of which others do not deserve, to give them better than what they deserve, to bring them hope in Jesus. I hope that I don't get in trouble today. I hope that <laughs> I'm able to go home and, and have dinner and, and all these things. And I, and I think that this is, can be a dicey line for all of us to walk because we've experienced this in many and various broken ways. I encourage you to simply let go of those things, those ways in which this hasn't worked in the past and try it fresh, try it new, see how it works in your relationship. And if it doesn't work the first time, keep at it, keep at it. Because at some point it will, at some point that light bulb goes on, at some point, that hurt and that long-standing pain will melt away. And what comes out the other side is a relationship filled with joy and with great hope. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for leading us and guiding us today. That through challenging words in your scripture, you open up a pathway for us to see your goodness and your light. Allow us to follow your son Jesus in every way knowing that in this broken world that it's not possible to do perfectly, but when we are forgiven, when we go astray, Lord, you call us to continue to serve you. We pray that this challenging, challenging way of looking at our relationships through mutual submission, we pray that this would take root and heart in our lives, that we would love one another with a sacrificial love, that we would see others around us as the way you do, as people who are greatly loved, and need to be connected back with you. In all of us, ask, Lord, that you keep our eyes focused on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.